Welcome to the Garden Talk Podcast, where we interview growers from all over the world, both beginners and experts, seeking to learn more about what they know about gardening and how they do things in their garden. Hey everybody, for those of you that don't know me, my name is Chris, aka Mr. Grow It, and you're tuned into the Garden Talk Podcast. This is episode number 143. In this episode, I interview Zaza from Zaza Genetics. He was on the podcast once before, back in 2021, episode number 31, where he talked about breeding on an intermediate level. This time around, we're going to continue the conversation. I have a whole bunch of good breeding questions for him this time around, and some were submitted by viewers like you. He talks about herms, back crossing, breeding autoflowers, and so much more. If you want to see short clips of these podcast episodes, search Garden Talk Clips on YouTube. I also have a channel where I show the plants that I grow. Both of those channels will be linked down in the YouTube description section below. One of my goals for this podcast is to bring free information about gardening to the general public. Now, that being said, I'd like to thank the sponsors of today's episode who helped make that goal possible. Thanks to AC Infinity for sponsoring this episode. Check out their all-in-one pH pen, which measures pH, EC, TDS, and temperature. The sensor probe is replaceable, and it comes with storage solution and calibration solutions. Click the link in the description section below so you can learn more about their all-in-one pH pen and the discount code MrGrowIt15 works on both Amazon and their website, acinfinity.com. Stash Blend. Stash Blend consists of several ingredients in one, so you no longer have to buy individual bottles. It includes corn steep liquor, seaweed extract, humic acid, beneficial bacteria, silica, and mycorrhizal fungi. It can be used in addition to your synthetic base nutrients or be used in living soil systems. Simply mix it into water and water your plants with it. You can get it at stashblend.com, link in the description section below, and use the discount code THESTASH. And we're back, and I'm joined with Zaza from Zaza Genetics. How are you doing today? What's up, brother? Good to see you, man. It's been a minute. Thanks for coming back onto the podcast. This is your second time on here. First time was on episode 31. September 12th, 2021, so several years ago. And that one has over 52,000 views on YouTube nice. alone. And I think it's got, uh, I don't know, another 10,000 plus on audio platforms. So nice. it did really, really well. We talked about intermediate plant breeding. We're going to continue that conversation today. Uh, although I mentioned intermediate, there are going to be some beginner things in here as well, I'm sure we'll touch upon. So don't want to scare away any of the beginners, you know. You'll definitely be able to um, grasp onto some things here that uh, we talk about today. But first, can you introduce yourself for those folks that didn't catch the first episode we did together? Absolutely. My name is Salam, Salam Sims, uh, better known as Zaza, owner of Zaza Genetics. Uh, I've been a breeder uh, for many years, Um, started out with animals many, many years ago, um, and eventually transitioned into plants. So... um, New Jersey is where I'm from, and um, I'm so happy to be here once again. (laughs) Awesome. Short and sweet. And I highly recommend after this episode, you guys seek out the first episode. I'll definitely have that linked in the description. Lots of good information in that one. And yeah, let's continue on the conversation here. I want to start with intersex traits. So first of all, you hear the word hermaphrodite a lot or, or herm. And somebody in the comment section said that's an offensive word. Is that actually offensive? Should it just be intersex traits? Are we are we changing things or, or what? Um, hermaphroditism is is a scientific term. So, um, you know, and, and when we when we think in terms of the vocabulary and language, it's super important, especially being able to tie those uh, th- those certain words to other words and definitions, and actually being able to get that hands on experience. So, you want to practice with um, the actual scientific word as close as possible. So, I recommend hermaphrodite. Definitely. No need to change it. <laughs> okay. And then I want to get a little bit deeper on you know what a hermaphrodite is. So there are a couple different ones, right? There's a female plant that shows pollen sacs, and then there's a female plant that shows nanners, two different ones. Can you explain the differences between the two? Absolutely. Uh, so uh, a natural herm, uh, which, which is genetically coded, um, it's, it's there in a natural state. Um, it, it is in the gene pool. It can't be uh, removed. The code per se cannot be removed. It can be um, bred to a recessive state where, where it doesn't expose itself uh, through, through selective breeding. But a natural herm 
uh, shows its characteristics by the actual sack that we're familiar with, the ball sack. Um, it, it, the pollen sack stores and collects pollen, and then its objective is to, once it's full, open up and release pollen to pollinate any female, uh, you know, within three mile radius or whatever it may be. Uh, so ultimately, it has a certain look, the, the balls, which are separate from the female parts. You, you won't see them together. You'll see female parts in one place and balls on another. And um, they'll, they'll have the agenda to basically pollinate a female using that pollen sac. Um, inside of that pollen sac are stamen, um, stamen which we know as nanners. So basically nanners on, on the other hermaphrodite, uh, which we, we tend to uh, refer to as uh, stress-induced. A stress-induced hermaphrodite will show nanners or, or expose uh, nanners. And typically, its agenda is much different because it's hidden. It doesn't necessarily want to be out and about and show everybody what, what it has going on, right? Like like the, the, the male pollen sac wants to just open up right there out and about for you to see. Uh, this is more of hidden um, because the agenda uh, and, and, and the reason why she's pollinating herself using these stamen is because she feels stressed enough to feel like uh, she needs to reproduce and possibly preserve her genetics in case of an emergency situation, basically. Okay. And you actually have a video on your YouTube channel. The title is why your plants should never herm. Can you answer that question here for us? Uh, because it's a sign of weakness. Uh, it's, it's what we know as an undesirable trait. Uh, and any any undesirable traits should be removed through selective breeding uh, by the breeder. Uh, you don't ever want to uh, release a product or, or put a product out um, and, and it shows any undesirable traits. Similar to um, a, the dog world, if you're buying or selling a, a puppy, you don't, you don't want to have an aggressive litter of puppies and you just, you know, selling them. Uh, that's, that's a super undesirable trait and it needs to be removed before any you know anybody else can can be in contact with it. So same thing with herms. So a breeder are they able to quote breed out the hermaphrodite trait, or is it just go from a dominant to a recessive trait, and it will stay as a recessive, and there's no way of actually breeding it out, getting it out of there completely. That's a that's a gr really good question. So um, it that is the case for the natural herm where. Like I said, genetically, it's still going to maintain um, its coding within the gene pool, but you can breed it to recessive where it doesn't expose itself. Nanners, on, on the other hand, they will be able to be made recessive because it's due to weakness. It's due to, um, and, and, and it's, that, 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 that's more so closely related to Darwin's theory of evolution and, and natural selection when we think in terms of only the strong survive. Um, all weakness can be removed, um, and it's not coded. It's a, it's a what we know as an inheritable trait, uh, weakness or stamen uh, or uh, nanners, inheritable trait. So it can be removed completely. But one of the things to kind of keep in mind is like when the plant gets all the way towards harvest, right, and you push it even further, it could show nanners. Would you consider still consider those weakness, or like all plants are going to pop out nanners at the very, very end if you push it too far, right? Well, that's still that same mechanism of stress that wants to, you know, it's, it's saying, hey, man, I'm way past harvest time. I haven't been pollinated. I don't like this. Something needs to happen now. Um, and that's still a sign of weakness. It's still a sign of stress. Um, a plant will um, probably, we could, it's safe to say that most plants will exhibit nanners if you put it past a certain um, but some to the point where you could actually identify them and see a whole bunch, some where it might just be one nanner throughout the whole plant because it's that strong enough to resist um, based on you constantly selecting for only the strongest. Stress testing is very important. So that's this is all directly related to stress testing and only the strong survive. Got it. And I think we're actually going to be getting into stress test on a separate podcast episode. We invited Zaza onto the From the Stash podcast, and we have a hot topic. I don't know if we revealed that hot topic to you yet or not, but it's going to be something along the lines of grower error or breeder error. Mm -hmm. And I think there's a fine line there because, sure, plants should never herm. If it does herm, it 
eventually falls on the breeders for not doing that stress test as they should before releasing it to the public. But what if it's a grower error, such as they're just blasting with too too much light, like too closely, they just they're they're doing something wrong within the grow, too high of temps or whatever. They're they're stressing out beyond naturally stressing it out. So we'll hold off on uh, any comments on that. That's gonna be a, that's a whole episode in itself, and I think it's gonna be a really really good one. So I was ready to go right at it, man. I'm, I'm glad you stopped me, man. Tune into uh, that was a good one. I'll tell you. Tune into from the stash podcast. That's with me, Rob from CLT and Pigeons 420. That's going to be a whole separate conversation, which I'm looking forward to. Last question I'll have on Herms before we move on. This is a question from an Instagram user. So I actually reached out, uh, posted an Instagram story and asked folks if they had questions for breeders. This was a question. They want to know, why are there so many intersex plants popping up more often across multiple breeders? Because there's multiple breeders popping up. They, they, they don't, uh, a, lot of, a lot of guys who consider themselves or call themselves breeders don't really grasp the concept of what a breeder truly is. So um, they think it's just as simple as one plus one and it makes two and you sell two. And, and you know, when you got a ton of people doing that, you're going to end up with a ton of undesirable traits throughout the, all of these different gene pools, man. Yeah, that's tough. Yeah, I mean, it makes sense. It seems like everybody's a breeder nowadays, you know what I mean? And there's a lot of inexperienced people, and they think that you just need to take pollen from one plant and put it onto a female plant, and then everything's gravy from there, which is far, far from the truth. So, yeah, that's that could be very reason why a lot of these breeders are uh, having intersex plants, because they're just not doing it properly. Let's get into uh, another one of your video topics. I was looking through your channel, by the way, Zaza had a, a great channel that's dedicated to breeding and uh, I'll have him linked down in the description section below so you can easily get to his channel, but lots of great, great breeding topics. One of them is stabilization versus uniformity. So can you talk to us about that? Yeah. Um, stabilization, a term that we hear often, um, stabilize the, or this, this, this strain is stable or, you know, um, and I think it's thrown around very loosely um, when we think in terms of uh, stabilization. Stabilization happens per gene, uh, per gene and trait. So uh, you stabilize and isolate genes and traits uh, one at a time. Sometimes it's, many times it's give, it, give and take. So you have to uh, be, be very mindful about how you select. But uh, ultimately, um, that is overall understanding so if someone's like yeah my strain is stable and they're really just f referring to uniformity of cross uniformity is going to be complete homozygosity we spoke about homozygosity and her heterozygosity in the, the first episode we did uh, originally and that was kind of the introduction for a lot of people to, to those terms homozygosity being complete uniformity uh, versus uh, when you hear someone say hey uh, that strain is stable, uh, what they're really referring to would, would have to be that, that that strain is completely uniform, meaning that each allele for every gene is identical for mom and dad. So mom and dad each offer you two versions of uh, a trait, or, or, uh, you know, and those versions can either be different or they can be identical. Uh, if, if dad is offering you a copy of blue eyes and a copy of brown eyes, that would be considered heterozygous. If mom is offering you a copy of blue eyes and then another copy of blue eyes, that's, that's homo, homozygous completely. Uh, and, and if we have every gene in every allele within the population identical on both sides, mom and dad, that is complete uniformity. But you can just imagine the time. I mean, even to get to the beginning, you, you, you're going to need a start point of about 20 years of selective breeding just to be, okay, now we can work towards uniformity. So a trait can be stabilized within a year, two sometimes, you know, depends on what your objective is. Talking about traits, I think a lot of people know what they're looking for when it comes to females, whether it be phenol hunting and then using that for breeding or, or what. There's so many different things you can look at. And we that's, I think, another thing we talked about in the first episode. But when it comes to males, I think there's a lot of confusion. You know, what traits should people be looking for when they're cultivating males and, and selecting for breeding? Can you give us some 
examples of things you can look for in regards to traits for male plants? Absolutely. Um, first one um, that is most important is uh, vigor, athleticism. Uh, you want uh, the most vigorous of the um, population uh, to start with. And um, then you can look at flower um, production and uh, terpene production. You can do stem and leaf rubs in order to see if you can get a little terpene profile. Uh, but ultimately, uh, I think Khalifa uh, Genetics, my brother Aladdin over at Khalifa Genetics said it best. Uh, he said it's, it's really similar to you um, trying to determine a daughter's uh, bra size by looking at her dad. So it's like, I, 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 don't, I don't know, you know, because we, 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 we only want the female, right? But um, how, how do we uh, ultimately make a good decision on a true breeder male when it comes to um, selecting? And ultimately, I would suggest taking it. I did a video on, on, on uh, picking males, too. Um, so, so for more in-depth explanation, you can go back and look there. But, uh, yeah, terpenes. Um, vigor and athleticism, number one. That, I mean, as long as you got that, you can, you can the rap, that's the most important. How about the cluster of flowers on a male plant? Is yeah, that? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. So that is something that's yeah. uh, valuable Flower. to look at. And yeah. also structure as well yeah. is another structure. thing. To, okay. Got yeah, it. Yeah. All good, all good um, things to look for after you find the most vigorous plant. So, um, and then you can ultimately make the best decision of what you think the female may come out to be, but clone, 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 that's going to be your ultimate key to going back in time, you know, whatever clone and document clone and document. I clone everything and I document everything. This clone, I like it because it is, I don't like it because it is, I'm keeping it for this reason. Um, and then we do that in stages. So this is early veg. This is, Middle veg, this is late veg, this is early flower. Mid so, uh, you know, we can keep track of everything and go back and, and with, our, with our selections. How about the stem rub technique for male plants? I know there's some people against it. They just don't believe in it. They think that the smell is going to be different when they do a stem rub in veg versus flower, for example. Do you feel the stem rub technique is something that, you know, first of all, do you do it? And when do you do it if you do it? I do it um, a little bit towards like mid veg. Um, I want to see, not necessarily because that is true. Um, typically, that aroma profile does change once you're in flower. The actual buds, it's not going to be the same as the greenery that you're rubbing on. But it's the the kick. Like if I get a nice boom, you know, hit me in the face, and I'm like, okay, that's it. You know, that's that's nice. So so you're not necessarily looking for an identical aroma, but more so. Um, effect of how, how, you know, like, oh, that's potent, you know, that's, you know, that's, that's fire, you know, whatever. Um, that's, that's kind of what you're looking for, not necessarily the exact aroma. Okay. And then color, another thing that a lot of people go after. Uh, I've got male plants that had some purpling on the pollen sacs, which I thought was pretty cool. And I always thought to myself, I'm like, hmm, if I select this over some pollen sacs that are, all, you know, all green, for example, does that give me a better chance to have some colors that come out in the offspring? Oh, yeah, sure. Absolutely. And um, when we think in terms of back crossing, there's so many different. And that's 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 back, back crossing is, is, is a topic within itself. I think uh, it's, it's another uh, tool that's very loosely um, thrown around uh, and, and people have uh, little to no knowledge when it comes to back crossing. They don't understand it. You know, most most people's understanding is you take a mother to the to the offspring, and that's a single back cross. That's a simple single back cross, and it has its own purposes. But then you have a a, a trans a, a, a more more uh, more in depth back cross uh, where it's it's recurrent, where um, you're continuously back crossing through five or six times in order to receive a certain percentage of the recurrent parent. You have a recurrent parent and a donor parent. Uh, the donor parent is there strictly to offer you a, a particular gene. Uh, so that gene is going to be fixed into your elite line versus you could, and this is where having knowledge uh, gives you confidence because um, 
in many cases, you would take your elite line, whatever it is you're working, let's say um, it is missing one particular thing like uh, mold resistance. But other than that, it's top-notch perfect. So you would be willing to take the most uh, crappiest of plant as long as it has the proper gene for mold resistance and do an outcross. Once you make that initial outcross, you end up 50-50. That 50-50 you're going to select based on that gene that you're, tra that you're tracking down. Um, which is mold resistance. You go back to the recurrent parent on a back cross. That then makes a new population of 25-75, which means 75% identical to the recurrent parent, 25% to what we know as the donor parent, because we only need one thing from it. And as long as we continue, the further we continue to back cross to the recurrent parent, we push out the genes for the donor parent until eventually we end up with about 98.6% at about six, six times, if I'm, my math might be wrong, but about 98.6% um, identical to the recurrent parent, but um, only maintaining one thing, which we selected for, which is that mold resistance. So everything else, the, the, the not frosty, the runt, the, all of that stuff is pushed out. And that is a, uh, uh, that's a real back cross. A single back cross is a little bit different. It's going to give you the ability to take uh, a gene from one parent and uh, introduce it into the background of another parent, but it's 50-50 still. So you still have 50% of the genes from the donor and 50%. So it's going to be a, a much faster um, result, but a lot of work that needs to be done behind it versus a recurrent back cross, which you can... Instead of just introducing a new gene, you're fixing the gene. And then we have third, the third back cross, which I'll mention real quick, and I won't keep rambling on, but um, it's a test tree, uh, a, a test cross, I'm sorry. And a, and a test cross is basically um, using a back cross as a way to identify a certain gene that may be dominant and determine um, whether that gene is dominant or recessive and end up with the correct ratio uh, by, by back crossing. So if we end up with a one-to-one, -one, then we know it's a heterozygous dominant. If we end up with a completely um, all the same dominant of all the offspring, then we know it's homozygous dominant. And that's a test cross, which is also a back cross as well. So do your research on back crosses, everybody. It's not that simple. It's, it took my guys who have a really strong, I mean, three years in just the basics, it took them about four days to really grasp the concept of back crossing. It's funny you got into back crossing. That was literally my next question nice. for you. Perfect. <laughs> and you didn't even get a list of the questions this time around, man. You're freestyling it here. So that's funny that you got into back crosses. Now, what's a reverse back cross? Hmm. A reverse back cross. That I'm not necessarily familiar with. Okay. Because I'm growing a Gelato 41 a reverse back cross. And I wasn't entirely sure what that was. It sounds like it may be a certain mechanism that was done before the back cross, like uh, it reversed the plant and then back cross, something like that. And it just adding in compound, but that's technically not a type of back cross. We have a test cross, a recurrent back cross, and then a single back cross. Those are the actual back crosses, those three. Um, but um, yeah, it was labeled as RBX. RBX. Okay, there you go. It reversed, yeah. So it was a revert, probably a reversal uh, done first and then a back cross. So that's that's fine as well. I mean, it's just a compound of mechanics. And, and, and that's the thing I think people get really confused as well is that all of these different mechanics, S1s, back crosses, uh, reverse back crosses, uh, whatever it may be, are just tools within your toolbox. Um, F1, F2, F3, every, every time you make a move, you end up with a new population. That population has a, a new purpose for your ultimate goal later down the line. So when you see people selling uh, this back cross or that back cross, ask some educated questions. Uh, what type of back cross was that? What was the purpose of that back cross? Um, from my understanding, a donor parent and a recurrent parent are used to introduce a particular trait. Which, which trait were you using? Uh, and why are you selling it? That's what I need to know. I need to know why you're selling it because it's super important for you and your ultimate goal, right? You, you, your ultimate goal, maybe 20, 30 years from now, is to be complete uniform, right? Complete uniformity. You want to make the perfect strain for people. Um, and uh, you, you can only do that by preserving all of your popular. I have DevOps OG. Um, I'll give you an example. 
you, Mr. Grow, was the only person that ever, ever touch an S1 um, many years ago, three, you know, I think, because, and that was only because I knew, I knew you didn't like, uh, you know, you would go test your stuff to make sure it was female. So, so I went into one of my populations, I said, all right, well, I'm, you know, giving the S1s, um, you know, that way uh, he don't have to test them, but I probably got about 20 something, 20, I don't know for sure, but about 20, over 20 different populations just for dead ops. So different F series, different back crosses, different, and, and they all have to be identified, they all have to be documented, and we all have to uh, keep track of them so that 10 years from now, I don't know what I have to go back and use. Oh man, boom, I got this from 10 years ago, this back cross that I did to do this, and, oh, it's perfect, this is exactly what I need. And I'm still working dead ops 10, 15 years from now, but now I'm even closer to uniformity um, so, so it's just those tools. So don't sell your tools. Don't sell your F1, F2, F, you know, F1 is, is, is where you are going to be introduced to, um, hybrid vigor and heterosis, your, your potential of, of, and that's a phenomenon. So it's not guaranteed. It's one in a million. It's a, it's a treasure. Uh, you're looking for a treasure chest. So you can't, you don't want to sell that. You have to dig and search and hunt for that, um, hybrid vigor. And if you can find it, um, man. You got, you got, you got, you got a gem. And then F2 is different because now that's the only way you're going to expose your recessive traits. That's my only way. That's my only chance. The only shot I got to expose the recessive traits. I can go back in time. I can go back in ancestry. I can see great, 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 great granddad. I can see how he used to walk. I can see all of these different, uh, just by going back in history. Um, and, and we do that. So, um, all of those different mechanisms, the S1s, the F1s, all of those different things are just different tools in your toolbox. Don't sell them. Um, each one has its own purpose. Uh, document that purpose. Make it important to you. And once it becomes important to you, you would never want to sell it. You have to understand your objective and what you, which direction you want to go. You want to go left. You want to go right. You want to go up. You want to go down. You need to know that before you move. So um, when you have purpose like that, you, know, you ain't going to sell, you know, I can't sell that. I can give maybe a couple to you, you know, but I can't sell. So whenever you see me selling these packs of dead ops, it's um, stuff that I called out of my population. So, and this is the thing. Once you get your gene pool to a certain strength, that's why stress testing is the most important strength. Sh uh, stress and athleticism is most important vigor. Once you get it to a certain point, um, then you can be confident enough to know that you won't have any undesirables that other people will complain about. So I can give you my throwaways, but you won't complain about them because they're not going to harm on you. They're not going to be stunted. They're still going to be good. They're still, you know, it's, it's just that I don't, for whatever reason, I'm selecting toward a certain direction and I have a certain objective and I need to accomplish that by removing anything that's not within that. Uh, which doesn't, you know, fit within that criteria. I want to bring it back to back cross for a minute here, inbreeding. So when you're working an inbred line, from my understanding, you get to a point where you should actually back cross. Now, I don't know if it's like an F5 or an F6, but if you go, if you continue to go down the line, apparently you come across like weird characteristics or something like that. So in order to avoid that, you would back cross. Can you talk to us a little bit about that? Yeah, so um, when you continuously go through the Mendelian road to inheritance through um, F1, F2, F3, F4, uh, eventually you do lose that what's most important to us, vigor. This is why I always stress vigor, 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 because it's the alpha to your omega. So when you're continuously going down, 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 you're losing all of this vigor and athleticism. Um, and the only way to... Uh, Repair that is to back cross. Now, a single back cross um, can be somewhat effective. Um, it can be somewhat effective. It, it just depends on how much inbreeding depression you have. So if you have a, a, a severe case of inbreeding depression, then a single back cross won't suffice. You'll need to continuously, um, but still, the, it's going to be a recurrent back cross. It's just going to be a different type of back cross. And then, um, you know, but just uh, uh, for, for a smaller, uh, less uh, dramatic case of inbreeding depression, then um, you could just do a single, go back to um, the, the, the right parent. 
Vigor, super important. That's why you always start with vigor. You can, you have the freedom to move about when you know you have a strong foundation. Got another question from a person on IG. The question is: Does a photo period need to be brought to f4 and/or stabilize before breeding it into an auto flower? So that's a good question. So um, we'll stay, we'll stay, uh, and I'll be able to answer that by staying on the topic of back crossing. Um, if I was to create an auto flower, I would do it through a series of recurrent back crosses. Um, that is the method. I would do my first initial outcross with a photo period and an auto flower. Boom, end up with 50 50, half, half. Then I would select the best auto flower from the new population to back cross to the photo period. Eventually, like I said, we'll, we'll end up, if we go to five, six, seven times back cross, we'll end up with 98.9% identical to our photo period. But now the autoflower gene should now be dominant. The problem is, is that the autoflower gene itself is much more complex than just the photo period gene, right? The, the autoflower gene is, and I don't want to get too uh, complicated, but we, we understand Mendelian inheritance to be F1, F2, F3 Mendel, uh, uh, Gregor, Gregor Mendel and his F1, F2, F3, F4. Right, that was 1865. It was a long time ago. From what he taught us, others have then started to, you know, understand different methods and ways. So um, there's non Mendelian um, inheritances as well. So when we think in terms of Mendel's uh, laws, we think of dominant and recessive. When we think in terms of non Mendelian laws, or inheritances, we, we're thinking about incomplete dominance, uh, over dominance, pseudo dominance. Thing, um, and autoflower is an example of incomplete dominance, meaning that two genes are expressing themselves at the same time in um, a way where neither one is fully committing. So it's incomplete versus uh, a photo period, which is a complete, completely dominant trait. Uh, within within a photo period, um, and that's just the complexity of the autoflower. So, to answer your question, um, a back cross would be the way to, uh, if you wanted to cross or create your own autoflower, a recurrent back cross, and then uh, once you get to about ninety something percent, you'll need to do a series of selfs. Uh, probably, you need to do some self pollinations. Uh, you'll need to do some Mendel stuff. You'll need to do some whatever uh, whatever mechanics that you have in your toolbox. You'll need to be ready to pull them out so that you can make your auto flower. But it won't be just as simple as uh, crossing this with this. It's, it's going to be pretty, but it's going to start with a nice series of recurrent back crosses. Okay. Now, could you hear me out? Could you take a photo period in an auto flower, do that cross, right? And then the offspring is going to be 50 50. Take an auto flower from there, confirmed auto flower, reverse it, and then use that pollen to like an S1, create an S1, then would you have feminized autoflowers at that point, the whole offspring of that or, or no? Well, well, no, it'll, it'll still give you a, it'll, it'll just be a percentage. So every, everything is a percentage and every, you, you, you think about it like every cross starts half and half. And then every time you do another successive cross, you knock off another half. So now it becomes 75, 25. Um, and when we think in terms of selfing, it's, not half and half, it's more so like a hundred because um, it's breeding to itself. So it's doubling up on whatever genes that sh uh, the, the mother is already expressing. So whatever genes um, that shows dominant or recessive will be double uh, what it was in her population once she selfs herself. So uh, it's a little bit much more faster uh, when you think in the terms of selfing, and, and you do get a higher percentage. I think it's uh, 75 to 25 off the bat, if I'm not mistaken. So I'm, I'm terrible at math, but I'm, I think that's about it. <laughs> <laughs> you touched upon testing a little bit, but I want to get a little bit deeper into testing. So somebody creates seeds, and before releasing to the public, they, do, they should do a series of tests. Some people just release it to the public, don't do any testing, 
which could be very harmful, right? Because you're you're pushing things into the population that it could be, you know, high percentage of hermaphrodites, for example. Maybe the intersect traits it ends up being dominant, and then you've you've released it to the public, and all these people are getting hermaphrodites. Happens with the donuts triploid, right? It doesn't seem like they tested did a very good job testing that because a large percentage, I want to say seventy plus percent, and we don't know for sure, ended up showing intersex traits. I'm trying to avoid using the word hermaphrodite. I don't know why you said it wasn't offensive, but but anyways, what is an ethical way to go about having genetics tested before releasing to the public? First of all, understanding um, the mechanics and knowing what you're doing. Like knowing, I think if people knew what they were doing, then they would understand what was required. They would be more excited about, um, because they, they, they would have the ability to create and really actually create and have influence on um, moving and fixing traits. And, and you're like, oh, man, I didn't know I could do this. So I think once you get to that point, you, you take it seriously versus people just taking one, you know, and then selling it. And then selling it. And, you know, they never even see anything. They don't know what's going on. They don't, they don't know what they're giving away. They don't know anything. But if you actually get here to a point of understanding and learning and get a strong foundation in the basics you do become the creator and you do take pride in that and, and you look at things differently. All right. Would you recommend like, I don't know, it's so subjective, right? It's like if you're breeding, you got a batch of seeds, do you then give it out to say disperse a hundred seeds to people or 500 seeds to different people around the world and then have them grow it out and then kind of give you feedback? Is there like, is that a good number or should it be kind of a percentage of the total number of seeds you get or, or what? No, no, you should never. Um, that's a red flag too. That's an indication to me that the breeder is not, um, doesn't really know what's going on because um, as a breeder, I need to build up my eye for selection. Like it's not easy. And I, I constantly say this all the time, um, 10 plants, Okay, cool. 20 plants, cool. But you hear people all the time, man, I'm, uh, that's not a phenol hunt. Phenol hunt is a thousand plants. You have no idea what it would take to look at a thousand plants with all these subtle differences. So you really have to train your eye and start with the four, 10, 20. And gradually you start to notice uh, changes within how you see things. And um, that that right there is, is, is what's required. Uh, starting small and then building your eye up so that you can select uh, but not just trying to throw out a million plants. It's not going to be conducive to you. It's, it's going to be counterproductive. Hmm. Okay, interesting. How about testing for pathogens? Hoplite and viroid, big concern these days. And that can be within the seeds, right? If you've had a plant that hoplite and viroid and you use that for breeding, it could potentially end up in the seeds and you could potentially disperse some. Do you recommend folks get seeds tested or plants tested prior to, to dispersing seeds? And, and we're just talking hoplite and viroid, but there are other pathogens out there as well, right? So what's your take on that? Absolutely, especially if you are operating these large facilities and you are doing this um, for profit. If you're doing this to sell seeds and make money and you, you, know, you, you, you have a big facility and all these things, you need to take every precaution. Um, and you should uh, go over and beyond uh, when it comes to stress testing, performance testing, um, just like um, any responsible breeder would, um, I'm, I don't want to release, I don't want anybody to see anything that is created by me, but that's less desirable. Like I don't, I don't even, even with the notation of saying, hey, um, this is just testers, man. Don't worry about it. If it, if it looks messed up, don't even worry about it. It's just a test. No, that's not. So, so nothing leaves my house messed up. It's, it's already built up strong confident is ready to leave the door when you step out the door do you walk out <laughs> you know like messed up pants halfway up you know dirty you have a shit no you you dress up you brush your teeth you you get yourself together and then you leave same thing these, these seeds these these genetics don't leave your house unless they are, are, are ready to to dress and impress so you don't have like a team of testers that will test your stuff prior to releasing you just do everything 100 percent your eyes your testing doesn't leave your house unless you're confident with everything that you are looking for. You want it to be. Yeah, I've never, um, uh, never, never uh, believed in in testing. Um, I, and I come from the dog world too, so um, 
There is no no testing. Um, if if I'm looking for undesirable trait, that undesirable trait could be aggression. I can't just, hey, man, hold this dog and let me know if it's aggressive. <laughs> <laughs> One day the dog pulled you out the bed. You know, you like. So um, ultimately, yes, it's the breeder's it's the breeder's responsibility for sure. Okay, let's flip it up. I want to talk about your creations here. What are some of the most exciting or unique strains that you've developed, and what makes them stand out? Gotcha. Um, so Dudops OG is probably uh, my my favorite. It's a, a hybrid cross of two land races from two different areas and um, two sort of heirlooms uh, and uh, that is skunk number one and UK cheese and on the other end is the cow hash plant and um, the uh, Ubekistan land race and um, one from a cold region one from a warmer region but um, land race just the land race influence and being able to uh, see the history of, of just the Bacal, how rich the history is with um, being able to um, use that and know that it is responsible for creating some of the uh, most valuable hashes around the world, you know, for thousands of years, right from that region in northern Afghanistan. And um, learning the villages and learning the different, um, and in Uzbekistan, the colder region over there. So I, I love the land race uh, influences. Um, I, I, for me, it's just another baby of mine. Um, it's nowhere near complete. Uh, it's probably like five years in the, in the workings right now. I've been working on it for about five years. So, um, and we constantly just prioritize and um, figure what is uh, important at the moment. Um, whether it's the customer is requiring something, you know, it's always a way you can make it better. So. DevOps OG, I would have to say. I don't have too many strings. I have uh, Boondocks Glue, which is a auto flower. Um, that's usually always on the back burner. Uh, rarely do I ever work two strings at once. Um, it's, it's not that easy. Um, it requires tons and tons of populations, like I said. So if I'm over here messing around with 13, 14 different batches of DevOps, I don't want to be doing nothing else with no other seeds. So, um, you know, rarely do I ever work two strings at once. So, um, I am working on the auto flower though. Um, it's a Siberian ruderalis times dead ops photo period. So we're doing the uh, auto flower from scratch using a recurrent back crossing method and um, probably some further self pollination to lock it in. Um, probably take about three, four years, three, three years. I'm assuming, hopefully. Awesome. Yeah. I had the opportunity to grow out dead ops. I think I had the F twos. I grew up like two of the F twos and then uh, F four. Oh, okay, good. You got some. Okay, I thought I gave you S ones. Was they feminized? I don't think so. I don't. Okay, I, I, all right, cool. Well, maybe that wasn't you. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, yeah, I could. No wonder you was looking at me like that. Like, ah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I was. I wasn't sure, but yeah, okay. I'm pretty sure it was an F two. You probably remember better than I do, man. I'm telling you, I'm burnt, man. I'm burnt. But I got some really good results off the F2s. I know that kind of opens up the the, the characteristics a lot on, on that generation. And the F4s, it was cool to see like what really more of what the breeder is looking for, more what you're looking for. Man, that fuel. Ooh. Oh, I loved it. So um, actually, I'm running out of stock right now. I got probably got to plant another one. And <laughs> it's something that I would definitely want to keep on hand at all times to consume. You know, I, I really like it. Oh, thank you, man. That's a vote of confidence for sure. And um, I'm, I'm sure I'm, I still got those same populations uh, hanging around. Like I, I got S ones, I got F ones, I got you know all dead ops. So um, and they all have a different purpose, man. They all have a they're all just a tool in the toolbox. And when you realize that that all of these tools, and you realize how important they are, and you realize your end goal, and you you start to see uh, certain strategies that you want to implement, then everything becomes important. You can't sell that. You're like, man, what if that guy opens up a pack and gets what, you know, gets what I'm looking for that helps me finish what I'm doing over here. So it's all about uh, being objective and, and knowing that uh, it takes time, man. It takes time. It's not going to be overnight. You know, we don't we don't do this to to make money off of it. Um, you do this and you find other ways to make money around it. But no breeder um, is really into this uh, for, for money. I mean, you might see some dog guys that that are successfully been able to uh, 
um, capitalize off of new, newly created breeds. But um, when it comes to guys who really understand uh, a, a, the, the objective of a breeder, um, money becomes like the last. You know, we don't we don't make money, man. We we preserve genetics. We save endangered species, man. We 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 actually have a hand in doing something great and being a part of history uh, and saying, man, that pterodactyl over there, man, he was about to die, but I was able to help bring those eggs back and you know whatever whatever it may be, uh, a dog, a puppy, a cat, a rabbit. Um, if it's endangered. Um, and you know you have the ability to help recreate and, and, and replenish. Um, and, and not only that, but um, enhance. So make it better um, so that other people can have it too. That's, that's what this is really all about. And if you walk into any of your local uh, 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 shops, whatever you want to call them, um, none of them have lamb races. Uh, they don't have that available for you because they're endangered species as well. So just think about that the next time you are looking for your next uh, two mother and father to breed together. Um, think about some of these poly hybrids who are responsible for um, almost eradicating our history when it comes to that. And land races and wild types are the history. We can't just do away with them. We can't just be excited uh, off, the, uh, off the lack of knowledge and just be excited off the names and the pictures and and you know um, the hype, uh, and, and then forget all about our responsibility and our history. So we got to keep it around. It's clear that you take an ethical approach when it comes yeah. to breeding, and that's definitely one thing I admire from you. And uh, you know, behind the scenes, I've, we've had conversations through DMs and stuff where I'm firing off breeding questions on you, and you know, you're somewhat of a mentor towards me. And, and really, uh, chill out, OG. The only cross I've ever done is. Uh, somewhat influenced by you and your direction. Yeah. So I appreciate you. You're doing an you. amazing job, too. You're doing an amazing job, man. Just keep going. Keep going. Take your time, man. Don't, don't, you know, realize what it is you want to do. You want to go left. You want to go right. It's your choice, you know, and then you take your time and make that choice. But, uh, you know, it'll, it'll, it'll be something of a household name 15 years from now if you stick to it, 20 years from now. Uh, make it so that people remember it. For, for, for good reasons. And um, for the guys that are just chuck, 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 you'll never have a household name. <laughs> Nobody will ever remember it, man, because you don't even remember it. They're like, well, <laughs> I, I can't even, who was that? I was, I can't even remember this train he created last week <laughs> because he created so many. But, uh, you know, Chill Out OG has the ability to, to, to be a legacy within our industry, man. So just keep chugging at it. You. Will do, man. Will do. So talking about the future, what trends or innovations in breeding are you most excited about? And how do you see the future of breeding evolving? Mm, that's a good question, man. I, I, I hold this game to such a high pedestal. Um, so a lot of times my, my peers, unless it's like my team, or, you know, they, they don't really grasp the concept. They don't see that far. And, um, and I always tell people, if you need to see where I'm looking at, if you need to view things from my lens – then you have to step outside of our community. Our community is not okay. It's not a place where they support education and they're going into the colleges, hey, learn this. Learn this about your community. They're not doing that. So, But when it comes to um, breeding dogs, breeding daisies, breeding corn, breeding strawberries, they are doing that. That's where you learn the mechanics. You need to step outside. And I think that's that's the largest mistake of many of these um, so-called breeders is that they start here as growers and they think it's just that simple. And then, boom, they don't realize that that education is not going to come from here because it's not here. Breeding, well, breeding this plant is not a thing. It's not a, it's not a thing. It's, it's, it's not even a real thing yet. So we are so far ahead of time when it comes to our industry step outside of our industry, learn the real mechanics, and then prepare yourself for the future. But uh, to answer your question and not ramble on, um, I hold it to a high pedestal. You can't take a pig to a pig competition without it being registered. I need to know its registration number. I need to know the name, the father, the mother, the seven generation pedigree if it's going to be in this competition. That's a pig. I mean, uh, and, and it should be the same for, for what we do. Uh, everything and all of these cups, man, I'm not even... 
you can't even walk up and, and say you want to be inside this cup unless you have a, a 20 generation pedigree going back to Lambricks that can show every mother, father, and ancestor in the lineage. And if it's gaps in that ancestry, then we can't consider you a purebred. We can't consider you a thoroughbred. We can't consider you a pure species. We just can't because there's no proof of registration here. I can't bring my dog, no matter how cool my dog looks, it does backflips, it can swim across the ocean, it can do all of these tricks. But when I bring it to the dog show, if it's not registered uh, with a three generation pedigree on file, then they're going to be like, no, nah. it can look like all the other Jack Russell Terriers, but um, it can outperform them all as well. But they won't even take you serious if you don't have the proper registration paperwork. And I think um, that's where I want to see this place. That's where it will be. It's going to take legalization federally one day, and it's going to take some genius coming out of high school or college to code some program that's identical to what they did over there at Seed Finder. Um, if you ever, uh, you know, familiar with that, then they, they have a database with the lineage, and that is super important um, from dogs to horses to pigs to corn to everything that we take seriously, the fruits and vegetables you eat in the supermarket all require that lineage, that documentation. They all require it, or it can't be bred within what we got going as a mutt. We consider it a mutt. Seeing that the how the industry is right now, how there are so many pollen chuckers and people just creating random crosses and pushing, it's hard for me to even visualize that far ahead. And exactly. I mean, you're, you're probably right. It's just me so being cool. a general consumer, small home grower. It's like, man, imagine if we could get to that level to where like, in order to enter a cup, you have to show documentation. Like we're not there yet, but that would be cool if it was right. Like that's that has to be the next level, right? Yeah, because it's the norm with everything else. Yeah, everything that's legal, it's the norm. Uh, it, nothing, nothing we we eat, nothing we consume, nothing, um, none of the it's livestock, animals, pets, none of those are considered pure unless it's registered with because that registration. And those, that pedigree, um, it gives you the ability to what we say, uh, what we consider confirmation. It gives you the ability to conform to, to, to the breed standard. So um, if you have all your registration, you have all your paperwork you have, then I can take you seriously and look at your dog and then check him out and say the ear is okay. The, oh, the tail has a little crook in it. Nope, not breed standard. It's not right. So even if we pass that registration, it's still... That just gets you to the initial test of saying, let's now let's look at your dog and see if it's a real pure dog. Uh, it has all of these champions in his bloodline and in his pedigree. Let's see if it's a champion as well. Um, or if it's just uh, a dog with paperwork that we don't consider um, breed standard. So same thing with, with you know, and, and it is hard to see because one thing we have to understand too, um, our industry and the guys that run our community that have been running the community of big companies, um, pollen chuckers, whatever, they have us desensitized to weak genetics. Um, they have us desensitized to hermaphrodites. They have the, especially the new consumer. Um, and I try to come, I, I try to combat that by saying, no, um, there's nothing you can do to my plants to make them hermaphrodite. Nothing you can do to make them expose weakness. It, that's, that's my responsibility. Um, I'm, I'm willing to say that and, and, and announce that uh, so that other people can take it serious enough so that they can um, be able to do the same thing. We'll keep fighting that good fight, man. And uh, hopefully we see some positive change here in the future. Let's uh, let's wrap things up. Can you tell the listeners how they can find you and what you have upcoming in the future? Yes, sir. Uh, ZazaGenetics.com, the website. We'll do a uh, Mr. Grow It 50% off coupon code as well. Too, hey. as as and uh, so all you guys want to check some out, just uh, use Coupon code, Mr. Girl. Uh, Instagram, zaza.genetics.official. Catch me in the Discord, man. I'm in the Discord every night, um, 9 p.m. We used to do classes every night, but the, the team, uh, my current team has, uh, they kind of, they kind of smarty art, man. They like, they bore me now because they think they know everything. They're super smart. I need some new fresh minds, man, to kick it with me in Discord. Let me, let me rock with you, man. Let's, 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 uh, let's, let's build you up, man. Let's get you prepared and let's drop you off in the community to, to combat this uh this this breeding uh, epidemic that we have known as pollen chuck all right we're going to change the game one way or the other through qce that's quality q 
community and education. We bring quality to the community only through education. So hit me up, man. I'm always in the Discord, man. 9, 9, 9 p.m. Eastern. Uh, always want to chop it up with you. Great stuff, man. I'll definitely have a link to Zaza's YouTube channel down yes, in the YouTube description. YouTube, too. I always forget it's a new YouTube. Yeah. yeah it's fairly new. So um, thank you. Thank you. We, we definitely need some subscribers for sure. Yeah. So click the link in the description section below to get to his channel. Uh, lots of good information there. Lots of topics that aren't really covered anywhere else. There's not a lot of breeders that are making YouTube content, uh, knowledgeable breeders, I should say, making YouTube content. So uh, it's a channel I tune into every now and then. And whenever you, a new video pops up, I'm usually clicking on it and I'm just like learning every single thing I'm, I'm learning from. So keep doing what you're doing, man. I appreciate sure. you. Shout out to the Patreon folks that keep this podcast going. Patreon.com slash Mr. Grow It. 100% of what is pledged through there go right back into the podcast. You keep this podcast going. So thank you to the Patreon supporters. And we've got a question for the audience here. What should we ask them? Favorite cultivar? What do you think? That's a good one. Yeah. Is it a good one? What's your favorite cultivar? Let us know because I'm always looking for new genetics and I'd love to see what you guys have grown out recently that is your favorite. Yeah, let us know. Maybe I'll uh, grow something out in the future. All right, Zaza. Well, thank you so much for coming on that podcast once again. Sir. Uh, hope you enjoy the rest of your night. Much love, brother. Peace, Peace out, everyone. Catch you in the next episode.